Amen. And again, good morning. I'm glad you're here on the last week of August, which means that summer is almost gone. It's trying to hold on with this next week of 90 degree weather, but it's going to be it's going to be gone soon in Jesus name. I, I, I pray that I command that because we have the best months of the year coming up, guys. I don't know if you know this, but September, October, anything that ends with burr, it's good. OK, September, October, November, December. All great months of pumpkin, apple, football, Thanksgiving, Christmas. I defy you to find any better stretch of time than those four months. Uh, but we're here in the last month of August, and we are in our fourth week of our series called Where is God? Where is God? It's a question that I assume that you've asked at times. I know that I certainly have. Where is God when I'm in pain? Where is God when I feel alone? Where is God when things are not going the way that I hoped they would go? And through this series, we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Esther. And if you wonder why are we doing the book of Esther and asking the question, where is God? It's because throughout the 10 chapters of Esther, the name God is not mentioned one time. And so we are finding God, even though his name is not mentioned, we are seeing God working behind the scenes of the story of Esther. Last week we saw how in chapter 3 we see this rise of evil. And we know there are times in our lives today where we're going to see the rise of evil take place. But I also want you to remember that the rise of evil is temporary because God reigns forever. Amen? And so while the rise of evil takes place in our society and our culture, but God reigns forever. It says in Psalm 37, 13, that the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. He knows that it's the end for them soon. And chapter 3 ends with really no hope of survival. But God will act as Mordecai and Esther respond to the new edict. Today's message is entitled, act fast. Act fast. We talked about that we need to remember in the midst of evil that God will respond. But it's always in his timeline, his timetable, not our own. The things that we want in our life, we always want God to act fast, right? We live in a culture that says act fast, act now, move immediately. We, we live in a go, go, go society. Think about the kids in your home. When they want your attention, do they want it in five minutes? Are they thinking about they might need it eventually at some point in the day? No, God, God, they say, Mom, look at me now. Look at me now. I need your your attention now, right here. We see this even in advertisements, right? They don't say, think about it and maybe consider, consider purchasing this item. No, they say, act now. Act fast because we don't know how long this deal is going to last for. And, and any of those commercials on TV, you, you've seen the TV commercials, right, for, for things, random things like a miracle bamboo cushion, or, or uh, uh, glow-in-the-dark shoelaces, or, or ev- evaporative cooling hats. Yes, these are all real things I looked up on the As Seen on TV website, okay? Those are real things. Um, but they want you, they want to encourage you to spend their money right now. Spend your money right now. Buy this now. However, when God acts and when he responds to evil, he does not always respond immediately. Unfortunately, he does not always act quickly or in the timeline that we believe he should work, but he's still working behind the scenes. And so I want to look at three things of how we approach God when we ask him to act fast. And know that we can trust God to help and deliver us, and we get to take refuge in him. As we've been going through the chapters of Esther, we've also been grounding this series in Psalm 37. Last week we talked about the wicked. Uh, He laughs at the wicked. He knows their time is coming. Look at the last two verses of Psalm 37. It says in verse 39 and 40, The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. It's important to note that when evil rises up and we need rescued, we need delivered, we have to turn somewhere 
to be saved. And a lot of times we turn to the things that will not end up saving us. We, we turn to our bank account. Our bank account will not save us. The government will not save us. And if we can't feel like we're safe, we're at least going to ignore the problems we have. We try to get our mind focused on something else like our, our Netflix queue or the golf course or whatever it is. But those things cannot save you. Even avoiding the problem, the problem will not go away. It says that he delivers from the wicked and saves them. Why? Because they take refuge in him. That has to be what separates us from the world. That in the bad times, the followers of Christ respond by taking refuge in God. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. He said, while trouble overthrows the wicked, it only drives the righteous to their strong helper who rejoices to uphold them. Do you know that not only will God hold you up, not only is he a refuge, he delights in being your refuge. He wants to be close to you. He wants to hold you together when things go bad. Trouble does not have to destroy us as Christians. It should lead us to the Lord in those times. And here in Esther chapter 4, we will see trouble leading Mordecai and Esther closer to God. And while we still do not see the name of God mentioned one time in this chapter, I believe this is the chapter closest, at least so far, close, so close to mentioning the name of God. But let's look at Mordecai responding to the edict. If you remember this edict, this plan comes forward that says we will begin to annihilate all the Jews here in Persia, every man, woman, and child. If you've got your Bible, you can turn with me to Esther Chapter 4, we'll also have it on the screen. As always, we have a sermon outline, notes available online. Check out the YouVersion Bible app. You can find our church there and find the notes or the Church Center app at the bottom of that homepage. Esther chapter 4. Let's read these first three verses together. <clears throat> it says, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai discovers the plans of Haman and the king, and he is distraught. He's devastated by this news, and he responds by putting on sackcloth and ashes. If you don't know what that is, that was an ancient tradition where you would put dirt or dust or ashes on your head as a sign that you were going through mourning. Many of the functions were meant as a means for the living to identify with the dead. You, you were putting dust on your head. You were tearing your clothes. It was a sign of burial or decay. And the sackcloth that was worn, it was very, very coarse, very uncomfortable to wear. And it was essentially a way to communicate your great grief. And so the first point as we talk about asking God to move fast in our life in the middle of evil, the first thing that we need to do is, number one, we need to take time to grieve. Did you know that grieving is important to allow ourselves to process, sometimes even share our emotions? We can't just hold things together in the bad times and through loss. If we suppress emotions... We cannot heal from them. We cannot learn from them. If we hold back our grief, how can we allow God to heal what we refuse to let go of? There is grieving for many things, whether we've lost a loved one or we're going through a, a hardship. We're going through something individually or we can be grieving for what's happening in our city or our state 
or our nation. And I think it would serve us well as Christians that when we see things in our nation that we do not agree with, that we don't condone, that our first reaction is to grieve rather than to get angry. Now listen, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Do you want to know how to know whether it's righteous anger or unrighteous anger? Does it grieve your heart first? Does it wreck you on the inside because you feel broken, because your heart is aligned with God and you know he is sad, and so therefore I'm sad, and then I'm angry because of what's happening in my world? We have to be careful the difference between that type of anger. But it's important to grieve the loss of life, to grieve the loss in different areas of the world when things are happening in Israel, in Palestine, all around the world. We need to grieve the sins of our world, grieve the hatred and the violence and the persecution. Because when we grieve, we draw closer to God. Part of grieving is also taking the time to repent. That doesn't mean that we're taking the blame for the things that are happening in our lives, the things that are happening in our world, I should say. But we're aware of the, the power that when we repent, when we come on behalf and intercede for our city, intercede for our nation and say, Father, forgive us. It's the same type of intercession that Jesus did on the cross when he was going through pain and he had done nothing wrong. And he saw the people out in the crowd that had put him on that cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We see the concept of, of grief through sackcloth and ashes. It's used all throughout the Bible from the beginning in Genesis. Jacob grieved when he believed that his son Joseph had died. David grieved when King Saul, not his friend, the person who was trying to kill him, David grieved when that man had died. Job grieved when he found all that he had was, was gone and lost. Isaiah grieved. He was weeping over the city. And remember the king of Nineveh, when Jonah came to them and said, repent, he and the city began to grieve and put on sackcloth and ashes as they repented. Did you know that Jesus also spoke of sackcloth and ashes in Matthew eleven twenty one, He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What was the reason for the sackcloth and ashes? It was repentance. It was a time to call out to God for forgiveness of what they had done. Repenting, meaning turning away, departing from that sin. My hope is that when we witness the evil that rises up in our world and we want God to act, we do so with a humble heart, interceding for our city. And for our nation, say, Father, forgive us of our sins. We repent, we grieve our sins, and we desire to turn back to you now. The application is to take time to grieve over sin and injustice. Let me ask you, have you taken the time to communicate your grief and your sorrow and your mourning to God recently? Have you asked for forgiveness whether in areas of your own life or interceding and grieving on behalf of your friends and your family and your city and your nation. It's not a punishment for us to grieve. In fact, it should be comforting that we can lament and grieve because we know that someone's listening to us. If you didn't know, this is, this is kind of a sad thing to share, but there have been reports and studies done of orphanages around the world in which those orphanages, the infants are very quiet. There's not a lot of crying. Because they've realized that no one is there to respond to their needs. And so they've ad adapted to their environment, and, and they've become silent, and they've suppressed their needs because of the absence of a relationship that responds to their needs. 
Whereas children who are confident in the love that they have in their caregivers, they will cry to get their attention. And we have to realize that we, as children of God, we can grieve and we can lament because we know there's a good Heavenly Father who hears us and responds to His children. If we desire to see God take action in our lives and in our world, we have to take the time to slow down and process our grief and lament before God. It says that Mordecai tore his clothes. He wept bitterly in great mourning. I wonder if Mordecai was struggling with this edict because he was taking the blame for what had happened. I wonder if he said, well, if I hadn't done this years ago to Haman, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Some scholars would say that his pride caused him to not bow down before Haman. I would, I would err on the other side with some other scholars that say, no, he did what he did because he was a Jew and he stuck to his beliefs. And we see from the end of the story how God protects and preserves Mordecai and Esther and the, and the Jewish nation. But the news of Mordecai's public distress, it eventually makes its way to Esther. Esther hears that Mordecai is in sackcloth and ashes and As Esther sends messages to discover the reason why Mordecai is sorrowful. And I find it interesting here that the king and Haman have made this edict and the queen Esther knows nothing about what is happening here. Mordecai knows, but the queen does not know what's going on. And so Esther tells a eunuch to return to Mordecai once she finds out his grieving, grieving and say this. Look at verse 11. This is what Esther says to Mordecai. She says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces knew, know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Now, it seems like it would be a normal, reasonable request that Mordecai is saying, Esther, you need to go to the king on behalf of all of the nation, on behalf of all the Jews. And it would seem reasonable that a wife could go to a husband and ask something like this. I'm just assuming there are some wives in this room that ask some things of your husbands like, hey, can you go out and clean the gutters today? Hey, can you clean up your, your mess over here that you got going on? Hey, could you not watch football all day on Saturday and Sunday, right? These type of things. And even in the Bible, there are other areas in the Bible where wives would go. There was influence there, right? We know that the, the wife of Pilate went, went to her husband and said, Hey, have nothing to do with Jesus. I had a terrible nightmare about him. Don't do anything with that man. We know that the wives of Solomon, they had a lot of influence, unfortunately, pulling Solomon away from the one true God to worship their false gods. But for some reason here in this kingdom, in Persia, they had a rule that said anyone who comes to the king without being called is put to death unless the king shows mercy and holds out his golden scepter. To make things worse, Esther says she hasn't been called to the king for 30 days. They haven't seen each other for 30 days. They don't share quarters. This is a massive empire. They probably have their own quarters in separate areas. And I'm assuming Esther says this to say, hey, I don't even know if the king likes me anymore. His affection for me might have wore off by now. We haven't seen each other for 30 days. How am I supposed to know if the king still likes me? And look at what Mordecai replies to Esther about going before the king. Look at verses 13 and 14. It says, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So Esther, 
She's brought some very reasonable concerns to Mordecai. But Mordecai won't hear it. Because he says the risk at this point is negligible. He says, if you don't do this, don't think that you can just stay up in the palace and survive this attack while Jews are being slaughtered in the streets. You as well will be destroyed because of this. But then he says with great faith, he says, but relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from somewhere else. He was so close, I think, to saying that God will bring deliverance from somewhere else. Because we see that Mordecai, he believes in God's protection and in his word. There's no other reason that Mordecai would believe there's a way that they're going to be protected and safe. Except for knowing that God was their strength. I told you this chapter has the most evidence of faith in God. Even though we still don't see his name mentioned in this book. But Mordecai believes the prophecies and the promises of God. And he says that God will deliver his people whether it's through you, Esther, or not. If you don't allow God to act through you, Mordecai is saying he will act through another. Our second point, as we wait for God to act fast in our life, we need to take the time to grieve. Number two, we need to know that God will move with you or without you. That's a hard thing to hear, isn't it? And make no mistake, God desires to partner with you to accomplish his plans. But just like the enemy cannot prevent the plans of God, your obedience or your disobedience will not allow or prevent the plans of God. It will not change his plans. I actually listened to a message earlier this week that went right in line with this. It talked about the delay. And Pastor Bill Johnson, he says, he said, you cannot speed up the plans of God. He would say, he would argue, you can delay the plans of God. It's not going to be stopped, but your obedience or your disobedience will change things. It will not change the outcome, but it will change who he works through or does not work through. And we want to give him our lives. We, I hope we desire to partner with God because he, he deserves nothing less than our full surrender to him because he sent his only son Jesus on the cross to die for our sins. So we owe him a sold out life for, for Jesus to be the responding to the voice of God. But I'm also thankful that my failure does not prevent God's work. But I'm much more glad when I obey and God works through me to share the love of Jesus with others. And we have to know that we have the opportunity to be the hands and the feet of God, to speak when God gives us something to say. We are commissioned to stand up for those who need to be defended, to help those who are in need. And God will protect his people and provide for his people, and he hopes to do that through our availability. And at the end of verse 14, Mordecai asked that, that powerful question to Esther. You've probably seen this verse out of context, right? Where it says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, maybe you attain that favor to be the queen for a time like this to be an act of God to protect his people. Think about that in your context. It's a reminder from two weeks ago that you might just be where you are for a reason, to witness to people, to share the great love that Jesus has for them, to remind yourself that you're not just an employee with a nine-to-five job. You're not just a student with a class schedule. You're a missionary in your workplace, and you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're there to see people in your workplace healed, delivered, and saved by Jesus. You are called for such a time as this, but don't allow your calling to lead you to pride. Because remember, God can use you. He can work with you, and he can work without you. That God can use anything. He can work through you. He can work through your friend. He can work through your enemy. God can use anything. He can use anybody. God can move through a Republican or a Democrat. Yeah, I said it. 
Don't, don't think that you're too special because you're God's chosen people. Because if you're not willing to be used by God, God can replace you with a talking donkey. Mordecai told Esther that relief and deliverance, it will rise for the Jews. Are you willing to be the one that partners with God to see him act? I hope that we're willing to be available as humble, obedient children of God. God has used some of the greatest kings that came before, and God used some of the worst kings before. God used people that had a relationship with him and those who did not. God will find a way to make his plans take place. He will find a way to deliver people. And Mordecai believed in the divine providence. It's important to remember that God does not need to rely on us in order to act. But we absolutely need to rely on him. It's not mutual. (laughs) Sometimes we get that twisted, don't we? But the fate of God's people rested on God, not on Esther. But yet Esther's fate depended on her faithfulness to God. Remember, Mordecai says, if you don't do this, you're going to be gone. Things are going to happen. People will die. But I will preserve the Jewish lineage some way, one way or another. That's a concept of trust and reliance that we get mixed up. We think that God needs us. When in reality, we are the ones that need him. We, we think that God needs our time and our energy, and that's why we're supposed to serve, right? That's why we're supposed to, to do all these things to bless other people. No, he encourages us to do that because we need to serve and give because he knows it's more blessed for us to give than to receive. You think that God needs your money in order for the word of God to be preached throughout the world? No. You need to give your money what God has given to you Because remember, all that we have has been given to us by God, right? Make sure we're on the same page. We only give back a portion of all that belongs to God. And he knows it's a blessing for you to give, for you to be a part of something greater than yourself. Because God will move with you or without you, but there's an incredible blessing for those who are willing to serve and to give. God doesn't do this to hurt you. He does this to bless you. Am I meddling too much this morning? I feel like I might be meddling a little too much. Should I move on? Move on? God will move with you or without you. And after this passionate plea from Mordecai, look at how Esther responds at the end of chapter 4. Read these last three verses here, starting in verse 15. It says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Esther recognizes that she must do what Mordecai has instructed her to do. But before she goes, before she goes to the king, she asks Mordecai to gather all the people in the citadel. And Esther will will gather the ladies around her, and together they will fast before she goes to the king. Our last point to be aware of before we ask God to act fast before the, the rise of evil in our life. We need to take the time to grieve, to remind ourselves that God's going to work with us or without us. And lastly, we need to take the time to fast, to fast and pray. Fasting is mentioned time and time again throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. It's being intentional with our time. That time that would have gone to preparing or eating a meal and instead saying, I'm going to take this time to fast that meal and to pray and seek God. There are times where we do individual fasts, but here we see an organized fast before Esther goes to ask for protection 
of her people. I know we don't see a lot of indications on Esther and Mordecai, on their faith in God, but I would certainly say that this is good evidence of a closeness to God. To take into account that Mordecai, from the beginning of the chapter, he's been lamenting, grieving, fasting, and he tells Esther that God's people will be safe one way or another. He will make it happen. And then they come together in fasting and prayer before she sets out to go before the king. We have to know here, church, that we are meant as the people of God, the body of Jesus, to fast and pray. Did you know that Jesus, when he spoke to his disciples in the New Testament, we, we know, first of all, that Jesus fasted, right? He went 40 days and nights fasting before his public ministry. We know the Israelites in the Old Testament, they would fast for a night before they went to fight against another nation. We know here Mordecai and Esther, they fast three days before she goes to the king. And Jesus was instructing his disciples in the New Testament. Do you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus? A couple people, good. Okay, we have a lot to do here in this church. We're going to do an altar call at the end. But when Jesus instructed his disciples, he says, when you pray, pray like this, pray like that. Don't do this, don't do that. In the same way, he says, and when you fast, fast like this, fast like that, don't fast like this. And my Bible, unfortunately, says when you pray, when you fast, it's not an option. It's a discipline of our spiritual walk with Jesus. And there are different ways to do it. I want to be sensitive to health needs, of course. But maybe it's just one meal. Maybe it's a certain type of food that you're a little too addicted to. Coffee, something else, could be anything, who knows. But you need to take a break from something. Give up something. A lot of conviction happening in this church today. <laughs> but fasting sometimes takes place because there's a need for repentance. And it's part of preparation. Maybe it's part of guiding you and directing you in something, some area in your life where you need some direction. But it's also as it's, it's important to know what fasting is. We need to remember what fasting is not. Hear me on this. Fasting is not a way of gaining any type of merit in our life. It is not a religious exercise to impress anybody in our life, and it's not a way of twisting God's arm. Do you want to know how I know this? Because when Esther fasted, at the end of that fast, she still knew that God was going to do what he was going to do. She says, and if I perish, I perish. She says, I'm going to get my heart right, I'm going to ask people to come around and we're going to fast and pray. But the, the solution, the results, the outcome is still in God's hands. Fasting was not a means of manipulating God into action. It was preparing our heart. We don't fast in an attempt to force God into action. It's getting closer to his heart and to listen to his voice and his guidance. And we've been talking about today's message that we need to we need God to act fast in the midst of evil, right? We want God to act immediately, but are we willing to take the time to grieve and lament and know that God can move through anything and everyone? And we're saying, God, act fast. And I wonder if God is asking the, his people, would you, before I act, would you fast? Would you pray? Would you prepare your heart for what I'm going to do? Worship team, could you come up as we get ready to close? Because I want to prepare ourselves for a move of God. I believe that God has moved through Esther in this story. He's moved in the middle of this culture, this evil culture that was not close to God. And friends, we live in a culture that I would say is not close to God. And before we close, I want us to give, to have an opportunity to grieve over our sins, to grieve over our city and our nation. And we're going to take communion together and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. And I want to end with the same scripture that we started with today. Bring Psalm 37 back up on the screen. It says in 39 and 40, remember, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. 
He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. We've been talking about the rise of evil and being overwhelmed with the things in our world. Nothing gets our heart ready for what's happening in our life. Like remember, Jesus' body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. And I'm gonna pray here in a moment. We're gonna take a moment and, and grieve. Whether you need to come to the front and just kneel and get right with God, you need to kneel at your chair, you need to just remain seated and focus on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Take the time to grieve over the areas in your life that maybe have not been committed to God. Maybe take a moment to grieve over the state of our city, state, and nation and say, God, we want to turn back to you in this time. But would you pray with me? And as we've been talking about this, about being overwhelmed, and I've said these things like we have a refuge in God, we can seek God, but maybe there's one or two people in this room that you're hearing these words, but you have not yet surrendered your heart to God that you've not made that personal decision to say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. And I'm getting overwhelmed and I'm anxious and I don't know what to do about it, but I've never given it over to you, God. I've never accepted Jesus in my heart and believe that he is my Lord and Savior. If that's you, and you say, before we take communion, before we pray, before we do anything else, I wanna get my heart right. I wanna accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, and you want to pray that prayer with me, would you, say, would you slip up your hand? Would you say, Matt, would you pray for me to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? No one looking around, not looking to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you in mind. Okay. Awesome. God, I thank you for this morning that we have the opportunity to come before you. We know that as your children, you hear us from heaven. And I pray, God, would you hear us as we grieve over our sins, over the state of our world. God, we come before you as the people of God to say, we don't just want to say, God, we're, we're sorry, forgive us. We want to repent. We want to turn away from our sin and turn towards you. And so right now, for a few minutes, before we take these elements, we recognize you. Holy Spirit, search our hearts, convict us into righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The worship team is just gonna lead us in a song. You can come forward, you can stay where you're at. Let's just worship and pray to God before we take these elements. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. God, we thank you for these elements that represent your body your blood. We thank you that right now we get the opportunity to, to plead the blood of Jesus over our lives, and we plead the blood of Jesus over our nation, and over your people, God. We repent. We want to do what your word says and humble our hearts and seek you, and you will heal our land. God, I pray that you begin to heal your land as we intercede on behalf of our world and our nation. It's only through your name, Jesus. It's only through your blood. It's only through you, the living hope. We take these elements today for forgiveness and we repent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, feel free to take these elements when you're ready. You're gonna need to lift up and push that tab back down to get to the juice. Done. Would you stand to your feet as we get ready to close? One more thing I'm going to ask you to do. We've been talking about prayer and fast, and we see in Esther chapter 4 when Mordecai and Esther, and they gather around this group of people to fast and believe for their protection. I want to ask today, would you join me 
as a church in a week of prayer and fasting this upcoming week. To take the time and pray and fast. Maybe you've got some personal needs in your life that you need to seek God about. You need guidance. You need healing, whatever it is. So would you take the time to pray and fast for that? And would you take some time to pray and fast for our nation? As we need, we need, we know we need to return to God right now. Amen? As a country. And so right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pull out your phone. That's right, I said it. Pull out your phone. If you're willing to fast and pray this week, we have a page on our website, thegathering.online. You scroll down on the main page, there will say a week of prayer and fasting. And in there is an area where you can submit to say to the church, I'm going to pray and or fast on this day or this day or this day, and you could submit it. And guess what? There's nowhere on that website, on that page, where we're asking you to put your name, your phone number, your email address, nothing. Because this is not you submitting this to me. This is you submitting this to God and saying, God, I am dedicating, I'm committing to taking some time this week with the rest of my church family to pray and fast on behalf of whether the things that are going on in my life and praying and fasting for the needs of our nation. Are you with me on that? Are you willing to, to take some time this week, maybe fast a day, maybe fast a meal, whatever you can do, take that time that you would spend eating a meal and pray and put God first in your life. Let me pray over this church before we close. God, we thank you for this morning and this time. God, we do come as your people to grieve and to mourn, lament over the state of our world. Maybe it's the state of our heart here today. And say, God, we desire to turn towards you. We want to move. We want to be part of what you're doing in this world. And so we are committing to fast and to pray and to seek you, God. To say, will you make a change in our nation and in our world? We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. We thank you that as children, you hear us from heaven. And we come before you to repent and to turn and ask you to heal our land. We thank you for these things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.